step back and take a look at Mill's larger project and agenda. Mill acknowledges that Bentham's attempt to propose the greatest happiness principle as the highest principle of morality, the one we can derive all other ethical principles from, is a failure because Bentham can't himself answer all the objections against it. But Mill sees something of great value in Bentham's work. Think of Mill's approach to Bentham on analogy with two different people looking at an old house. One person says, it's worthless, outdated, no longer useful. Tear it down and build something new in its place that will actually be what we need. Another person says, wait, this house has great bones. We should renovate it, update it, fix what's wrong. Then it will be a great place to live. Mill is thinking about Bentham's GHP like the second person who wants to turn the old factory into great loft apartments, as opposed to the first person who says, tear down the ugly factory we don't need anymore. Mill believes that Bentham's central insight is correct and undeniable, that the most important feature of human beings is that we're motivated to seek pleasure and avoid pain. And if we ignore our relationship to pleasure and pain, we'll miss the overriding fact of human existence. When some people hear that message, we're afraid that admitting we are so motivated by pleasure will take away our dignity and nobility as human beings, that if we follow our urges to put pleasure first, those urges will drag us down into the dirt with the pigs. We'll only care about food and sex and getting drunk all the time. Mill is convinced that those fears are unjustified, that if we pay close attention to the way human pleasure actually works, we'll be on the right track. Here's an example I think Mill would like. Pigging out versus hosting a dinner party. Most of us love to eat, I certainly do. And I admit, I sometimes do have the impulse to buy the best cheesecake I can find, lock myself in my apartment alone, and eat the whole thing. That's definitely an option sometimes. And we can see the selfishness in that, especially if someone lives that way all the time. It would turn out to be degrading. But here's one of the things that keeps me from living that way. I also love making food for other people, putting together a party and making all kinds of good food and watching people take pleasure in eating it together. And sometimes along the way, I even forget to eat myself. How could that happen with somebody like me who loves eating so much? Well, apparently, as much as I like to eat, I take even greater pleasure in feeding other people the best food I can make. Now that's really interesting. What would happen if I went all the way down that road? And of course, that kind of experience is what's behind Mill's distinction between higher and lower pleasures. What I've discovered is, for me, I prefer the pleasure of feeding delicious food to other people, even to just eating maximum delicious food for myself. I also love learning, but even more fun than learning is sharing knowledge through teaching or writing so other people can share the insights that I've gained. Of course, not everybody is a cook or a teacher, and maybe this is something Mill doesn't think or write enough about. That different individuals may have different higher and lower pleasures. He seems to think we can use his panel of qualified judges to declare certain pleasures to be higher or lower in some absolute sense. We can store that up for later when we look at some of the weaknesses and limitations of Mill's theory. But for now, let's stick to this really valuable insight he's offering us. Based on this clue that sometimes we gain more pleasure from giving pleasure to others than we get from just pursuing our own pleasure. That's the clue. So in the next video, let's see if we can see where that clue ultimately leads us. Where does that road go if we go all the way down it?